and uh, I grew up in Scotland, so you might hear a little bit of my accent come through. Um, I currently actually work at Intel, um, and I do security assessments on free and open source software um, while working um, at one of their sites in Oregon. Um, at 24, I left a career in HR to study computer security, forensics, and ethical hacking. And potentially, because I did work in HR, um, social engineering is a point of um, absolute fascination for me. So now that the introduction is out of the way, I'd like to ask you, what do you think that a hacker looks like? Uh, depending on your age demographic, you might think of Elliot, you maybe think of Neo, or if you're like me, <laughs> your mind goes, that's right, <laughs> to the 95 classic Hackers. Starring Angelina Jolie and Johnny Lee Miller, it was a roller coaster adventure following a group of teams with awesome names like Crash Override, Acid Burn, and Serial Killer. This is definitely the world that I thought that I was entering when I got into security. Um, I don't want to brag, but teenage me was really good on the rollerblades. Sadly, I <laughs> and most of the hacking world will never be that cool. The reality is, is that the real giants of security, and especially social engineering, are a little different. This is Kevin Mitnick, who is um, who was arrested the same year that hackers came out. He's arguably the most famous hacker and a master of social engineering. This is Frank Abagnale Jr. He was pulling off amazing social engineering stunts back when it was just called being a con man. And Hollywood even made a movie about him. More on that later. This last example is lesser known. Her name is Carrie Farrell, and she was dubbed the hipster grifter. Now, she started out with small scams in Salt Lake City and eventually made her way to New York City. Once there, she lied her way into a job at Vice magazine before convincing her friends and a sizable part of the late 2000s internet that she was very ill and in desperate need of money. She was soon caught out on that lie, however, and ended up in prison. Actually, all of the people that I've just talked about ended up in prison for their activities. These people tricked others out of their money, out of information, and out of goods. So why would anybody look up to them? Why am I talking about them right now? Well, just like we appreciate those who find bugs in code and ways to exploit systems, we in security admire social engineers because they find bugs in the way in which society interacts and expose them. Um, while the original intent, intent for some of these activities was for the lulls, um, social engineers now work to um, show the fixes that are needed to be patched in our everyday interactions and social contracts. So you know this is a serious part of the talk because we've moved from pictures and GIFs to text. <laughs> it's easy to have a vague idea of what social engineering is. Some people say it has to include malicious intent. Some people say that it even includes the act of befriending somebody. Others, um, are like the question of ninjas versus pirates, there are lots of opinions here. So for the purposes of this talk, let's go ahead and define social engineering. The tactics often employed in social engineering um, exploit cognitive, basises, bi cognitive biases in human behavior, especially the values that were taught as children, kindness, helpfulness, and trust. If humans were systems, these values could be seen as both bugs and features. There's a lot to be gained from a social engineering endeavor. Information, access to sites, um, money, anything really, it's re only limited by the actor's um, imagination. Often social engineering relies on direct or implied non-truths, uh, with the goal being to get the target to act in a way that they normally wouldn't. And there are lots of ways to lie. Lies are surprisingly easy. Just ask any kid that's been caught doing what they shouldn't. I'm sure they'll produce a great one for you. Um, I'm six feet tall, or since we're in Europe, I'm 163 centimeters tall. Lies are easy, but they're not always believable. The believability of a lie 
is in its framing. And in security, it's this framing that shows common traits. And we can use these to um, categorize attacks and find ways to combat them. In, in the rest of this talk, we're going to be looking at some common and not so common tactics to look at ways in which they can be combated. Now, I struggled, I looked, but I struggled to find any Norwegian examples of social engineering. So most of the examples I will be using will come from the US and the UK. Um, I would love to hear about local examples, though, if you know of any. So please feel free to tweet me about them. So our first um, example here, or tactic here, um, tailgating, is probably the second best known social engineering tactic, um, at least in the US and the UK. Um, tailgating is when a bad actor follows somebody into a secured area without their knowledge. And piggybacking is when a bad actor tricks somebody into allowing them into a secured area. So can I get, I don't know that I'll be able to see them, can I get a show of hands? Um, how many people have work IDs that you have to have in order to access your office or building? Yeah, quite a few of you. Um, companies are normally really good at enforcing these types of rules, and this is because having an unauthorized person in the building carries huge risks. These include theft of equipment, theft of proprietary hardware, theft of intellectual property, um, and even potentially workplace violence. It's also a high-risk activity for hackers. If they're physically there and they get caught, it's almost certain that charges are going to follow that. Um, it's a lot harder to escape physically than it is to um, hide your tracks on the internet. So um, I worked with a company um, in Oregon who got hit. Um, they had a, a person come in claiming to be a workman. There was some trade work being done in the building, and so it didn't seem unexpected, but this person said that he had lost his pass and needed a new temporary pass. And, you know, the, the security guard, he just wanted to be really helpful, and they got to chatting, and um, the guy got a new, a new pass. And it wasn't until three days later that they realized this man wasn't actually a workman, um, and he had had access to the building for three days. Um, in those three days, he stole several um, thousands of dollars of worth of hardware, um, including laptops that had proprietary information on them. And that's not something that can be got back even if the hardware got, gets back, is, is brought back by the police. So it's really important to follow through and, um, and uh, ensure that unauthorized ac people don't access um, your, your physical site. These attacks work though because we're taught to be friendly and helpful people. I, I mean, I, I do it all the time. I want to, to help people around me. It's, it's a kind of a natural thing. Um, these attacks are also more common around holidays, especially Christmas. I mean, who doesn't want to help the overburdened delivery man who might have a package that you're waiting on? For the hacker, um, getting an employee to help them is great. It buys them legitimacy. Um, if you see a stranger in the office, you're, but they're with your coworker, you're a lot more likely to not worry about it and assume that your coworker has done the due diligence to ensure that, they are, that these people um, are who they say they are and should have access to the building. So our next um, tactic is phishing. Um, phishing at this point is probably the most common type of attack. Um, phishing is seeking sensitive information through a deceptive email that masquerades as a trustworthy source. Has anyone here not received a phishing or spam email? Yeah. Uh, most often, phishing is a wide net activity, um, which means that they just send an email out to any email address they can find, because even a 0.01% response is still productive for them. Um, as this graph shows, the number of phishing emails um, is increasing at an incredible rate. And I think the most common example of this, or at least the one that has kind of worked its way into um, our minds as, as a society, are the, the emails that you get from the Nigerian prince. Um, 
These types of scams are also called advanced fee fraud scams or 419 scams. And the 419 scam name actually comes from the section of Nigerian law that governs fraud and con artistry. So if you've not actually heard of this, um, what happens is that you receive an email from somebody um, claiming that they have a large amount of money um, that they need to move from point A to point B, normally out of one country and into another, but that they need somebody in your country to help them move that money. And they say that they will give you a portion of the money um, in return for your help. Um, and if you reply to these, it can be really interesting because um, as you go through it, um, they say everything's fine and then suddenly there's a problem, perhaps there's a fee that needs to be paid and they, they don't have the money, they need you to provide that money. So let's say you provide that money. Everything sounds fine and dandy until, oh, somebody needs to be bribed and maybe you give them a little bit more money because you know, at the end of the day, you're gonna get a lot more money than you're putting out at the end of this. And every time you give them a little bit more money, something new happens that they need a little bit more money. And this continues until either the person who's giving money gets wise to it or um, they run out of money, and then when they contact their, their person that they're trying to help, um, either wanting information and demanding to know what's going on, or saying that they have no money, that person disappears and moves on to their next target. So 419 scams have actually been around for a really long time. They were traced back to the Spanish prisoner scam from the 18th century. Um, and this type of scam was really common in the 20s. Um, so it, it, it's gone from letters to faxes to emails, and we're even starting to see it um, in SMS texts. And it's so common that in the 20s, the um, American Secret Service created an address for victims to send information to, to let them know that they've been targeted um, to, to try and seek help. Um, and it may seem strange to um, a lot of us who really only know of the role of the Secret Service um, that they play in protecting um, the American president. Um, however, their original mandate was, which they still carry out, was to investigate counterfeiting um, of US currency, among other frauds. So in March 2016, a company in the US called Pivotal um, just on a, on a normal day in, in that time of year, it's tax season in America, um, and a, uh, a payroll um, employee got an email from the CEO asking for um, the information, the tax information for everybody in the company, and the email looked legit. He didn't think anything of it, so he pulled all the information together and sent it off to the CEO, except that it was the CEO that asked for the information. It was an unknown actor, and this information um, is now out um, in the wild, and these people are all um, at risk of um, identity fraud for the rest of their lives because of it. Um, unfortunately, Pivotal aren't the only company who have been attacked in this way. Um, a company called Monarch Beverages, who are based in Indianapolis, um, were also hit by the same type of attack. Not once, but two years in a row. It can be really difficult to distinguish some of these emails. Um, there's lots of types of phishing. Um, the Nigerian Prince emails, like I said, are like a simple wide net activity. Um, the Pivotal and Monarch attacks are good examples of what we call spear phishing, and that's a, um, a highly customized and targeted attack on a target that has access to um, uh, an, a large amount of information. We also have identified um, whaling or CEO fraud, which is a p phishing attack that's aimed at high net worth people um, who can be subject to um, blackmail or um, other activities once they've given out information. There's also what is unfortunately called smishing. Um, this is um, SMS um, phishing, where links are placed in texts um, asking people to um, take immediate action. So I, I know I've received one claiming to be from PayPal saying that my account's been locked and I need to click on this link um, in a text and give them all my information. Um, 
And as that kind of comes more into play, um, social media phishing um, is becoming a far larger thing. Um, people on Facebook are receiving emails from long lost friends. Um, these can be really insidious because the person might contact you and say, oh, I remember you from high school or middle school. And I don't know about you, but I've got a kind of fuzzy recollection of that time period. And so I might start talking to this person and you know, that's just like a, a normal conversation. We start talking about the weather and about old times and then maybe the pet that I had in high school, what, what was that cat's name again? And oh, what didn't your mother, did she uh, change, didn't she like get married? What, what was her maiden name? They try and pull these little facts out of you that they can use to then go and change your email account password and log into it and get a lot of really good information that they can use for identity theft. It's estimated that um, 600,000 Facebook accounts are compromised because of this tactic every day. So it, it sounds like it would be easy to pick out, but it can be quite difficult. Um, a follow-on threat from phishing is ransomware and um, these are often um, presented as an attachment um, or a, a, a link that they send you to, and there's an automatic download at the site, um, which downloads this, this, this program, which actually um, encrypts information on your hard drive and then gives you a lovely pop-up like this that asks for your money um, in order to get your valuable information back. Um, in April, Last year, um, a, a news company in the US estimated that $209 million had been lost to ransomware attacks in the first three months of the year alone. And that was just in the US. The worldwide numbers are far larger. Now, it's not actually just finance that is at risk um, with ransomware. It seems like something out of the game, but in March last year, an unidentified healthcare provider reported, critical monitoring cri reported a critical monitoring machine um, going down in the middle of a um, medical procedure. And this was due to a virus scan that had been triggered by a ransom attack, ransomware attack on the network. In this case, nobody was hurt, but in the next incident, the story could be very different. Um, and currently, healthcare facilities and educa education facilities are prime targets for these attacks because they have so much vital information. So let's look at an example email. Uh, let's just take a couple of seconds here. How many indicators can you count um, that this is a non-valid uh, email from Apple? Well, all of these highlighted spots are, um, are signs that this is not a real email. Um, firstly, uh, I'm not sure that, e that Apple actually used this servidor gugesh.eu um, address. Um, also, the Apple logo um, is incorrect. I don't think I've ever seen them actually put a TM mark next to next to that, and I'm pretty sure that it just normally has the Apple. I don't, I don't actually use Apple, so um, some of this is, is a little strange to me. Um, also, um, if you are an Apple customer, I'm sure that they would address you by name, because you're their customer and they know who you are. Um, and the next one is they're, ask, they're telling you something horrible has happened and that you need to take immediate action. This is always a sign that something may not be quite right. Um, especially when they give you a link within the email. Um, hovering over this link, it actually goes to metcornbread.com. I'm pretty sure that's not an official um, Apple email account, um, or not email account, website. And as you look through it, you'll probably notice there's a couple of spelling and grammar errors. Um, these are actually done per on purpose to try and weed out um, people who are less gullible. So the way to combat this is to verify your source. If you get an email from somebody and they're asking for immediate action, um, contact them via another method. So go to the website, like navigate to the website yourself and log in um, in a normal manner and check your account. Or even call them to see if they, um, 
if they know what's going on, um, if it's the type of company that you can contact that way. Don't use links in the email. They're always a bit suspect. Um, and be critical of your sender email addresses. That first one that we looked at doesn't look right. Um, and distrust demands for immediate action. Take, take a moment, I know it can be difficult, especially if it's an account that's really important, but take a moment to, to think before you act. And also think about the information that you're putting online. A lot of these um, attacks um, will actually, if, if they're really interested in you, they will look at your Facebook and they will look at your Twitter and any social media accounts that you have to try and glean information about you that they can use um, to make their attack look more legitimate. So we'll move on to pretexting, or in Scotland, um, blagging. Um, this is an invented scenario that um, is specific to a target. Um, there's normally a lot of previous research and setup, and this information um, is often used for legitimacy and to make the con seem um, more more real to the target. Um, so. Some examples here. Mitnick, who we talked about um, earlier in the talk, tells this amazing story about how he suspected another hacker of working for the FBI. But at the time, all he knew was the guy's phone number and a name, which he was pretty sure was fake. So um, at the time, in the, in the 80s, um, the way that phones were set up in the US, um, you could tell. Um, who had issued a phone number, what uh, telephony company had issued a phone number, and then contact them about that number. So that's what he did. Um, he, called, he called them and just spoke to a normal customer service, service agent. And when she asked his name, um, he said, um, it actually, it should be under um, the US government. It's, it's not under my name, it's under, U it's under the US government hoping that she would be helpful enough to actually tell him the name on the account. She did. She said, are you, Mar are you Mike My uh, Martinez? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's me, I'm Mike. By the way, what's my uh, account number? And through just being very friendly and giving the right answers, the right questions, um, he was able to get a lot of information out of the out of the agent, she was really helpful and even ended up giving him um, the account information as well as the last three months of call history in order for him to, to look at. So for me, pretexting is probably the most interesting form of social engineering because it's the most creative and it holds the most potential. You can get a lot of information. Um, the Hollywood movie Catch Me If You Can was actually based on the life and exploits of Frank Abagnale. Um, and he, he's amazing. He's, he's done some really incredible stuff. Um, in his late teens, he actually pulled an amazing scam off with the Pan Am airline. He found out um, what hotel um, their pilots and um, stewardesses went to. And he contacted the, the head office and said, hi, I'm, I'm a new pilot and uh, the hotel has lost my dry cleaning and I have no uniform and I need to get on a flight and, and you know, I, I can't do my job without it. And the woman on the other end gave him the name of the local company that made the Pan Am uniforms. And through the information that she gave him, he was able to go there and get a new uniform and then walk onto a flight. And he flew to, I think, over 29 countries on 200 and some odd flights um, during the period that he was able to convince Pan Am that he worked for them. It's, it's, un it's unbelievable. The movie is great. I, I highly recommend watching it. Um, and we're now seeing pretexting scams on a large scale. Um, in America, these are often targeted at the ill-informed or the elderly. Um, the best example, I think, or the most common example in America is that um, people often get 
telephone calls from companies claiming to be working on behalf of Microsoft, saying that their computer has actually contacted Microsoft to tell them that they have a virus. And this person on the phone wants to help. And if you just go to this website and download this simple to use program, it will get rid of the virus for you. Well, if you didn't have a virus, you do now. Um, and this, there's a lot of people who just aren't, who have computers but aren't as um, informed and get caught up in this. My grandmother um, actually got hit by a really interesting call. She, her phone rang and she picked it up and there was a voice on the other line and it said, Grandma, Grandma, is that you? And she goes, who, who is this? And they're like, Grandma, I'm in Mexico and I, I've, I've, my money's gone, I need help, I need you to send me money. And she said, Mark, is that you? And they said, yeah, grandma, grandma, yeah, it's me, Mark, I need your help. My grandmother went, I don't have a grandson named Mark, and hung up on him, <laughs> which is great, something that I've told her is getting through. So uh, yeah, these, t these attacks can be really scary for people who don't, um, who don't have savvy people in their life who know who know how to avoid them. So talking about pretexting, we've used a lot of examples and I've I think I'd like to think that I've shown how varied and complex that they can be. They're really um, personal and elaborate and that makes them really hard to combat. Um, but the ad best advice is to be suspicious. It doesn't come naturally, but always be a little suspicious of something that seems off. If it seems weird or too true or somebody seems too nosy, or maybe they know too much, start asking questions. Be cautious, be cautious with unusual requests and verify from a third source where possible. Our next tactic is baiting. This is literally the real world Trojan horse. Um, have you ever found a CD on the street or maybe seen a USB sticking out of a wall? Um, or connected to a mysterious Wi-Fi in a pinch just because you need to check that one email? Well, baiting is literally putting the carrot out and waiting for your target to bite. The CD or the USB are infected. The Wi-Fi is being snooped on, so they're watching your traffic. And we're even now starting to see tower spoofing, which is when somebody um, puts up a fake cell tower and can listen in on calls, texts, and web traffic of people's mobile phones. Now, it's not even just data at risk. This image um, has been circulating um, around security communities for the last probably month. And for those of you who don't believe your eyes, yes, that is a firecracker that's rigged to trigger when the thumb drive is used. The best way to avoid um, uh, this type of attack is don't pick things up and put them in your computer. Um, you wouldn't put candy you found on the floor in your mouth. So treat your computer with the same thought. So the way that we stop these types of attacks is being aware and having personal vig vigilance. Um, from a company's point of view, um, an uneducated employee is the number one weakness. If we don't give them any education on why we make security decisions, on why we have security rules, then people are gonna cut corners for convenience. Um, it's really important to adequately inform employees and get buy-in. Um, HR knows that an engaged employee is more productive and more involved and more willing to go to bat for the company. They're more willing to ask questions. So why do companies fail to get buy-in from their most valuable assets and stakeholders? Well, this is because they don't prioritize security education or they don't deliver it at all. Other companies focus on compliance um, with click-through click e-learning that's quickly forgotten. And it's really hard to trust users that have subpar training. And sometimes it's down to budget constraints. E-learning cuts training costs up to 60%. Training is expensive. Companies rely on tools to protect and minimize users' interactions with security issues. 
And that's great from a, from a tech standpoint. I mean, the less spam email I get in my inbox, the better. But these tools don't prepare, employee, prepare employees to deal with the, the attacks that slip through the cracks. So how do we change? How do we move forward from a point of poor education? Well, we need to change cultural thought process. This isn't just an IT issue, it's a business issue. Now, I recognize that cultural change is hard, and that statement deserves its own talk, but we need to talk to employees about why and engage with them on these topics, and sometimes it takes baby steps. We need to ditch e-learning and start creating a space for recurring bite-sized training in classrooms and backed up by video. We need to engage our employees by showing security isn't just for the corporation, but it's for personal use as well. Uh, you're gonna get spam at home just as much as you're gonna get it in the office. And then we should really be following that up with simulated attacks that employees can take part in. Because I don't know about you, but I remember things that I do way better than I remember things that somebody just talks at me about. So we've covered several topics about social engineering and how businesses can improve. We've talked about tailgating and phishing and pretexting and baiting. And we've kind of covered that um, buy-in requires education and cultural shift. Right about now, some of you are wondering, what does this mean for me? Um, as a developer, why, why do I need to know all this? Well, being aware and understanding the ways in which um, hackers misuse social interactions provides us a tremendous opportunity. It's an opportunity to talk to your friends and your family and share this new knowledge. But also, and maybe more importantly, it's an opportunity to look at what you're developing in a new light to question how it could be misused and maybe stop a social exploit before it happens, you can become a champion of social engineering education. So that's it from me. If you want to learn more, I would highly recommend that you read these, couple, these books by Kevin Mitnick and Frank Abagnale Jr. Um, I'd just like to take an, a moment to thank Web Rebels for having me and thank you for being a fantastic audience. Thank you so much for your time. That's right, the sofa. Yeah, the sofa. <laughs> Maybe during the next break, I'll steal one of the bean bags and then yeah. it'll be a different seat. Uh, that was fascinating. I liked how you used uh, Frank Abagnale as like this inspirational guy. Like, yeah. <laughs> if he can sneak on to 29 flights to different countries, you can do anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was cool. Um, so you talked a lot about social, social attacks that the, the tech component is pretty crude and, and a small part of the effectiveness. Yeah. What can we do as developers to prevent? I mean, I mean, it seems like the obvious way to prevent it is, like you said, education and fixing the social vectors. But are there technical things that we can do also? Um, yeah, I mean, I've come across some websites that have come straight from my bank. and. They look like there's something out of the 90s. Like they just look terrible. They look, they look like an attack, and, and it's difficult because I'm I'm on the phone with my bank, and they're telling me that this is a legitimate website and mm. that that I should use it, and that's fine for me because I'm verifying from a third source. But for for others who look at this website and maybe don't question it, they're actually being trained to trust bad sources because of this archaic website design um, that really needs updated. So I would say that encouraging your company to, to look at the way that they're presenting all of their website designs and encouraging them to update that and make sure that um, these things stay in line with the, the current designs that people don't get taught to trust bad websites that um, are crudely put together. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Uh, you, you showed a lot of bad things to do that we shouldn't do. <laughs> Is there anything that we can take from those bad things and apply in a good way? Does that make sense? I mean, like, don't put firecrackers in USB Definitely keys don't and do that, explode yeah. people's computers. But like, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's my question. Is there are, are there positive things that you can apply this, these? types of skills to? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I think education is really the, the most important one. Talking to people about, about these things. And, and like I said, I couldn't find any examples um, from Norway, which I thought was amazing. Um, and maybe I wasn't looking You're at impervious. the right sources. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that on that front, if it's not something that's found its way here, it's something that could find its way here. Um, certainly I know that um, the, the types of people who carry out these attacks are always looking for new targets, especially targets that aren't aware of these tactics. And so kind of preparing your friends and family and telling them that these things are happening in other countries and could be something that happens here um, would, would be fantastic because it would maybe stop that, um, that risk from opening up as greatly. Another question I had was around the tension between openness and, and privacy and security. The web is all about openness and free sharing of information, but we have these bad actors that are encouraging us to kind of clamp down, you know? Yeah. Um, how do you balance those two things? Um, it's, it's really difficult. For a, a really long time, I had absolutely no presence on the internet just sure. because I was, I was concerned about that very issue. Yeah, it can be a, an attack vector, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's just important to be mindful of what information you, you put out in public and what information you use in security um, settings. So if you put your phone number out there um, for the world to see, then maybe doing two-factor authentication using your mobile phone number um, for texting is maybe a bad idea. Or if you have put the name of your first pet or your mother's maiden name, or the type of car that you first had um, out on the internet, maybe don't use those um, for security questions to reset your accounts online. If you like tweeted your social security number and got a lot of retweets. Yeah, exactly, yeah, definitely <laughs> avoid popular. that one. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense, cool. Well, thank you so much for your talk, it was fantastic. Thank you so much fantastic. for having me. Cheers. Yeah.